I'm convinced that Lincoln is the best writer among American presidents. I read a lot. My admiration for him just kept growing and growing and growing. How did a man who lived on a prairie, who lived on the edge of the American frontier, come to actually embody what it meant to hold the Union together? Someone who came from humble beginnings, someone who was pretty much self-taught. I mean, he only had about nine months of formal education. His father was a very violent man. His mother died very early. We have to see him essentially as a kind of orphan. His father hated books. And he realized from a very early age that the only way I can survive is through reading. The lack of education, the poverty, the brutal father, the quality of feeling lost, the need to search for language. The first words he wrote were, in the sand, I am Abraham. One of the many qualities that made Abraham Lincoln a truly extraordinary leader was his ability to communicate. He was a master of words, words that reason and words that strike the emotions. Lincoln's reading was essentially his life. The 19th century American loved literature. I think that it was an absolutely necessary thing for him to survive the psychic stress of his situation. His father treated him as if he were a slave. Lincoln would not have been the only child who was exploited by his father. But Lincoln took exception to that. He grew up having a different impression of slavery than the average person did around him when he was at his most stressed out. He turned to literature. In the Lincoln household, although there would not have been many books, certainly the Bible would have been there. We read A Thousand and One Nights. He loved having Dickens read to him. Aesop's fables. And he loved Byron. As a young man, he was introduced to Shakespeare. Shakespeare formed him in, in a very fundamental way. Lincoln knew much of Shakespeare by heart. He could quote entire plays. He seemed very drawn, and it's understandable why, to these characters profoundly at war with themselves, caught in an impossible place of moral uncertainty. When he writes his own poetry, it can be rather dark when he talks about returning to Indiana. The poem that comes out of that, it's heartbreaking. I love the bear hunt as a, uh, a reminder of Lincoln's poetical bent, which he exercised only three or four times in his entire life, but a reminder of something he really didn't like, which is blood sport, and yet he uses it to dramatize the, uh, the perils and adventure of a frontier life that he was all too happy to leave behind. But who did this, and how to trace what's true from what's a lie? Like lawyers in a murder case, they stoutly argue-fy. And so you're looking at this document, and you see them working and struggling, and you go, wow, OK. Um, I can transport myself back in time and imagine the conversations that are going on. They may be sitting there in the 19th century with an oil lamp and you realize that it's not as bright as it needs to be. And so uh, the scribble gets a little tighter as the day goes on because they're struggling to be able to see. His language is an essential mystery. We can look at its sources. We can look at Shakespeare, we could look at Byron. They're not going to explain the melodies and they're not going to explain the Gettysburg Address. Without reading, he never would have been able to shape the language that he was able to shape later on. Lincoln was someone who valued words, who understood the power of words for good or ill. We don't know what Lincoln wrote as his original Cooper Union Address because when he had it printed and proofread, he threw it away. He didn't care much about archives. It was the speech that made Abraham Lincoln president. I just can only imagine what that manuscript looked like. It was never the first draft or the second draft. He was a reviser. Until it was exactly the way he wanted it. If you go to the second inaugural, you get some glimpses of Lincoln's own development. The second inaugural address, one of the most 
spectacular prose poems. He's talking about God's retribution and that the war is punishment. He does draw on the Bible. The second inaugural is poised between biblical Shakespearean articulation and something very spare and American that Twain is helping to usher in. The Gettysburg Address used a combination of poetry with religious language. He knew the right phrase at the right moment to embrace the right thought and to bring in the, the largest audience for that expression. He was very witty on his feet, not just a frontier debater. You know, we have great orators out there, but they aren't necessarily able to connect with the common man in their language. Helped him enormously in, for instance, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He wrote in this message, knowing that it was not just for members of Congress, but for the public who would read it in the newspapers, that traitors had sugar-coated the rebellion. And the public printer came over to the White House and said, Mr. President, you can't use the expression sugar-coated. It's not presidential. And he said, the day hasn't come when the people don't understand what sugar-coated means. Let it stay. And that was his genius. There were words to be heard, but words to be read. And it's the rare speaker who can craft a talk that reads as well as it is heard. His miraculous ability to condense his thoughts in applicable, understandable English remains an aspirational model for modern politicians. His ability to connect with people was a tool he used a tool to achieve his objectives, to save the Union, and to proclaim a new birth of freedom at the end of slavery, to help bind up the nation's wounds at the end of the Civil War, and to chart a course toward a more perfect Union. He absolutely believed that slavery was a monstrous crime, doing enormous damage to the moral and social and economic life of American democracy. There were members of Congress who anything were happy with Lincoln, and let alone the more radical Republicans who were inclined to really insert language into the Constitution that addressed equality and opportunity for African Americans. And we know that Lincoln was not a radical abolitionist. And this is always an open debate among scholars, to the degree to which Lincoln was in front or behind them. He was someone who valued all people. He may have had different attitudes about the worth of one person over another based on the opportunities they had had, but he certainly thought that they were on his level in terms of their rights to the fruits of their labor. For although volume upon volume is written to prove slavery a very good thing, we never hear of the man who wishes to take the good of it by being a slave himself. He certainly could not have interacted with someone like Frederick Douglass and not realized that there were black people who were his intellectual equal and who perhaps surpassed him. Lincoln's own thoughts continued to evolve. The Lincoln pre-president was a man who was conflicted about the place of slavery in the American body politic and the place of African Americans. It doesn't mean that he would not have been willing to forget about freedom for black people if he had been able to preserve the Union without it. He is giving up certain of his attitudes about emancipation when he issues the proclamation. When he signs it, these people are promised freedom. He's saying to other people, you say you won't fight for Negroes. Well, it seems they will fight for you. The colored population is the great available and yet unavailed of force for restoring the Union. The bare sight of 50,000 armed and drilled black soldiers on the banks of the Mississippi would end the rebellion at once. A lot of Americans who are not really familiar with the history of the war are not aware of how important African-American soldiers were to the cause of the Union. When Lincoln calls for the enlistment of black men into military service in the army, and that was a really big deal. When he writes that letter to Andrew Johnson, he's following what he'd actually outlined in the proclamation. There will be a time when the war is over, and I'm paraphrasing this, that there will be black men who can hold their heads high and remember that because they served as soldiers and were loyal to the Union, they helped to preserve this nation and there will be some white men 
who will have to hang their heads because they will remember that they had attempted to hinder the Union. African Americans wanted to play a role in their own freedom. This is not a war about secession. This is a war about the end of slavery. I went to public school in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the Civil War was called the War for Southern Independence. Lincoln was a hated figure. He continued to prosecute the war and move it forward and make uh, terrifying decisions that just got worse and worse. He was sending men to their deaths. By the summer of 64, he and Grant were engaged in fighting, the likes of which the human race had never seen, from an army commanded ultimately by a man who really hated violence. So much of his pain and so much of the glory of his writing comes from the fact that he's surrounded by death. It's Edmund Wilson who said that Lincoln imposed himself upon the nation, not as a statesman, but as a poet. The melancholy, the despair, really also shaped his language in a way that it shaped no other presidents. We are not quite willing to accept that Lincoln is a complex individual with some issues that are common even today. What we know less about is that private Lincoln. He's such an impenetrable character. Someone who didn't keep diaries and didn't have a journal and, uh, and really kept his own counsel. He's endlessly interpretable. And that's why he's an enigma even now. I mean, even for scholars who think they know him best. Any of his close friends described him as being both a spectacularly warm person and a very, very cold person at the same time. His law partner said he knew him best, but he didn't know him at all. He was the most shut-mouthed man he ever knew. He betrayed people when he needed to, never uh, capriciously or sadistically. He was a chess player. What his cabinet thought was, well, we have this country bumpkin, and we're going to, you know, just uh, tell him what to do. And they discovered this was a man who was much shrewder than they were. We see this perfect individual, this man who sacrificed himself for the cause of freedom and for the Union. But on the other hand, we see this man with a very dark side, someone who's gloomy a lot of the time. Lincoln had melancholy from a very early age, and he suffered two terrible nervous breakdowns. Has dreams, you know, of his own death, who really seems to like poetry. That's a little bit on the dark side. The letter to Fanny McCulloch was just so touching. Lincoln is not just trying to comfort her. He's trying to comfort himself. His son, Willie, had died a few months before, and he was still in mourning, so he understood exactly what this young woman was feeling. When he's telling her, time will heal you, it'll feel better. Right now, you may think that it's never going to get better, but it will. He's trying to convince himself of that because he's still mourning Willie's loss. In this sad world of ours, sorrow comes to all. And to the young, it comes with bitterest agony because it takes them unawares. How is this man able to survive? with a wife who was half mad, a son who was going away to war, uh, generals who hated him and, and, and didn't want him to interfere, and yet he prevailed. He prevailed. He did it in part through language. And you're reminded that no matter how great they may be, how influential they may have been in their times, they also struggle with the same things that all humans struggle with. How do I say this? How did I say this in such a way as to convey my deepest and truest beliefs and feelings? By the time of his death, in that last public address, he is talking about extending the right to vote to black men. He wasn't somebody who waited until the people led him. He actually shaped public opinion and led. Something Frederick Douglass said about him, I think in 1875, he said, Lincoln knew us better than we knew ourselves. Any of his speeches where he's talking about equality of opportunity would resonate today. Lincoln remains a powerful figure, both in history and historical imagination. 
Lincoln believed that everyone should have equality of opportunity, having the right, as some historians have coined it, to rise. We look at his language, the language he used, whether it was in his speeches or in his writing, and it's extraordinary because it's all at once. It's very simple, but it's also very eloquent. We've never quite had anyone like that in office who spoke to us as directly as he did, and who's still speaking to us, actually, after 150 years. Even in this view, I am proud, in my passing speck of time, to contribute in humble might to that glorious consummation which my own poor eyes may not last to see. Abraham Lincoln showed us the power of the presidency to redeem the promise of America. And he showed that great care with words could be a big part of that redemption. His massive talents were a gift to us all and will continue to inspire us and give us hope for many generations to come.